Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, Joyce will be teaching a Spirit-filled message entitled, What's Been on Your Mind Lately? Okay, open up your Bibles and get yourself out some note paper and get ready to make the devil mad because you're going to find something out that maybe you didn't know. Proverbs 4.23. Lord, we thank you for the Word. We pray that people's minds will be renewed and their eyes will be open to the truth in Jesus' name. I'm calling this message tonight, What's Been on Your Mind Lately? You know, if we would really take a little inventory of what's been on our mind lately, we could quickly make a connection between what's going on in our life and what's been going on in our mind. I went to church for years and years and years and years, and nobody ever told me my thoughts had anything to do with my life. I had no idea that I could think my own thoughts or choose my own thoughts. I had no idea that if I was thinking something that wasn't correct, that I didn't have to keep thinking it. I think it's a shame when we sit in church week after week after week, and if we're not told the things that are going to help us in our practical, everyday life. It's great to learn about doctrine. We all need to be sound doctrinally, but we need to know how to live we're never going to have the life that God wants us to have if we don't know what to do about our thoughts. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Now, a couple of things to not miss here. It's your job to guard your heart. Everybody say, it's my job. And we could also read this, guard your mind. It's that inner life, what's going on inside of you. You have to be careful about your thoughts. You have to be careful about your attitudes. Thoughts produce attitudes. I'm sure you've heard the phrase that your attitude determines your altitude. In other words, what your attitude is really determines how far you can go in life. Guard your heart with all diligence. When you do something diligently, it doesn't mean you do it once. It means you do it over and 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 over. And I might stop right here and say that as long as you live, no matter how spiritual you become, as long as you live every single day of your life, the devil in some way, shape, or form will try to inject wrong thoughts into your mind and you're going to have to choose to cast down those wrong thoughts and think what will benefit you and what will benefit the kingdom. Now, in the beginning, that seems like an almost impossible job. It seems like such a problem because we've let our minds run rampant for so many years and we have so many bad mental habits that when we first begin to find out that our thinking needs to change, it literally almost seems like that almost everything you think is something you shouldn't be thinking. And if you're anything like I was in the beginning, you're like, <laughs> but trust me, if you will keep at it, keep learning the word, keep praying about it, keep being diligent, little by little, day after day, it'll get better and better and better and better. But that doesn't mean that the devil will ever stop attacking you. It just means that you will get better at keeping the door closed to wrong thoughts. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Now, there is a life that Jesus died for us to have a specific life that he died for us to have. When you become a Christian, you're not supposed to just keep all of your same old misery and mess, only now put a Christian label on it. So now we don't just have a normal mess anymore, now we have a Christian mess. Or now we don't just have normal misery anymore, now we have Christian misery. And obviously we all know that in the world there will be trials and tribulations. But I love what the Apostle Paul prayed. He said, 
My determined purpose is to know Him and the power of His resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. So obviously Paul was saying that even though we're in the world and in the world there will be trials and tribulations and even though there's going to be people hard to get along with and there's going to be disappointments and there's going to be loss and there's going to be tragedies that through Christ and through His resurrection power we can find a place in Him to live here but live above the mess. I'm not promising you you'll never have any trouble if you become a Christian. But I am promising you that you will never have to try to solve your problems by yourself. Because God promises that once you let Him into your life, He will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you on the mountains and with you in the valleys, through the fire, through the floods. He'll be with you. And our mind is so important. How we look at our problems is so important. That's why we need to believe what the Bible says when it says that what Satan means for harm, God intends for good. Then when you're in a difficult situation and all of your thoughts have a tendency toward negativism and, and, and just fatalism and there's no hope, nothing will ever change. If you know the Word of God, then you can open your mouth and you can say, what Satan means for my harm, God intends for my good. This may be bad now, it may look bad now, it may hurt now, but somewhere down the road, this is going to work out for my good. And if you'll begin to think like that, now you're energized to make it through your situations. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you have no hope, everything just begins to sink. You can see hopeless people because everything about their demeanor is down. Their faces are down, their shoulders are down, their arms are down, their conversation's down, their attitude is down. But Jesus said, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Everything about him is up and everything about the devil is down. Amen? We need to remember that the Word of God teaches us that if we love God and we'll continue to pray, that all things work out for good. They may not be good, but God is good. And because God is good, He can take a mess and turn it into a miracle. He can take a tragedy and turn it into a triumph. And I'm not just being preachy and trying to hype up the crowd. This is a fact because it's happened in my life and I know that many of you who've been walking with God for a while, you have the same testimony. Those of you that are new in your walk with God or you haven't decided yet whether you want to walk with God or maybe you are walking with God but you have a struggle right now, let me remind you that you need to be careful about what you think and what you say in your times of trial and tribulation. The attitude that you have while you're in the wilderness determines how long you're going to stay there. Would you like me to say that again? The attitude that we have while we're in the wilderness determines how long we're going to stay there. You complain and remain. You praise and you'll be raised. Turn to the person next to you and say, what's been on your mind lately? Now, you know, one of the sad things is, and I won't get around to teaching about this until later on, but you know what some of you know, you know what your answer was? Nothing. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Empty space is a place. And people having a passive mind, just being empty headed and not thinking about much of anything can be just as big a problem as thinking wrong stuff. Because empty space is a place and the devil's always looking for something empty that he can fill up. If you stay busy thinking about right things, the devil won't be able to fill your mind with wrong things. Hello? That's why it's so important to stay involved in helping other people. That's why it's important for you to be in some kind of service work in the kingdom of God. It's important for you to have plenty of time to rest, 
but it's also important not to have so much time on your hands that you become bored and all you have to do is just sit around or lay around and think up what's wrong with everybody else. We need to stay busy serving and helping one another. Mm -mm -mm. 2 Corinthians 10, please. Verses 4 and 5. Now, as the weekend goes on, each one of these messages, I believe, will get a little better, a little better, a little better, a little better. Tonight, I've got to try to lay a good, solid foundation about the importance of the mind and the importance of your thoughts because I don't want to just assume that everybody knows this. There was a time when I didn't know it, and there may be people here that don't know it, and there certainly are people watching by television in various parts of the world who have never heard in your whole life that your thoughts have anything to do with what's going on in your circumstances. For the weapons of our warfare, verse 4 says, we are in a war. Could you say, I am in a war? <laughs> For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. Well, if they're not physical weapons, if they're not carnal weapons, then they must be spiritual weapons. A natural weapon you can see, you could go pick it up, but a spiritual weapon you cannot see. You have weapons to use against the enemy, but they are invisible. Equally powerful, but not to be seen with the natural eye. That's why so many people never learn how to do proper spiritual warfare. They are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. Now, the next verse is going to tell us really that this stronghold that we're talking about has something to do with the mind. Inasmuch as we refute arguments, theories, reasonings, where does all that stuff go on in your mind? You ever had an argument with yourself? Has God ever been leading you to do something and you reasoned your way right out of it? People have so many theories about God that some of them can't believe in God. So we refute arguments, theories, reasonings, and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, which is found in this book, the Bible. And we, we lead, we lead every thought captive and every purpose captive unto the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, if I can put it to you plain and simple, what you have to do is you have to get to know what's in this book so well. And it's going to take time. If you want to be a victorious Christian, then you are going to have to read and study, and you're going to have to dedicate time. You're going to have to invest time in educating yourself. Is there anybody here that would like to go to a doctor who just prayed a prayer one day to become a doctor and went and hung out a shingle. <laughs> but anybody, would anybody want to go to a dentist like that? No. Man, when, when we are going to go get help from somebody, we look for the professionals. We look for the highly educated. We look for the experienced people. Well, you know what? You can come and you can pray the sinner's prayer. And if you're really sincere in your heart, you can invite Jesus into your heart. And you can go to heaven strictly because of the blood of Christ and because you believe in Jesus and you've given your life to him. But you will not walk in victory while you're here if you don't learn what's in this book. You will not walk in victory while you're here if you don't learn what's in this book and not just learn it, but apply it to your life. You can even come to meetings. You can go to church and you can hear the word and hear the word and hear the word. And you can have so much stuff written and underlined and stars and check marks and so many colors in your Bible that you look like the, I mean, the church theologian. And that still doesn't mean that you know anything. The only way we know if we know anything is by looking at what we're doing. Amen. Amen. You have to know this. And when you begin to know this, then when a thought comes into your mind that doesn't agree with this, then you know it's a lie. Then you know it's a deception. Then you know it's Satan trying to find entrance into your life. And then you, you make a decision. I'm not thinking that. You cast down 
those imaginations and theories and reasonings. And you bring every thought captive unto the obedience of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> well, that's why we're here tonight. One of the things that I try to teach people to do, if you're thinking one thing and you say something else out loud, it interrupts that thought. And so if you're not yet at the point where you can just stop thinking something, then when you're thinking the wrong thing, start saying the right thing and it will interrupt that thought and then you can think on something else. That's why it's important to know the Word of God and learn how to speak the Word of God out loud, out of your mouth. When the devil says, that's it, you've done it, you have messed your life up good and proper now, it's finished for you. That's when you need to know Jeremiah 29, 11, and you need to open your little mouth and you need to say, the Bible says that God has good thoughts and good plans toward me and that he has a future planned for me. The Bible says that I can let go of what lies behind and I can press on to the good things that are ahead. So devil, you are a liar. Although I have made many mistakes, I have a future. But if you don't know that, if you don't know that, then you're just going to... Before I knew these things that I'm teaching you, I would wake up in the morning. I never knew when it was going to be. Maybe every other day, every third day, every fourth day. I didn't know. And I'd wake up in the morning and this thought would come, you're depressed. My husband would say, good morning, how are you? And I'd say, I'm depressed. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, I got so mad when I realized how much the devil had stolen from me just because I did not know what I needed to know. It's great to go hear your preacher and your teachers, but you've got to know for yourself. You're, you can't have victory by osmosis. Satan relentlessly seeks to build strongholds in our minds. He's a liar. He only lies or twists the truth, which is a lie. And he tries to deceive people. He tries to get them to believe things that are not true. And that's what it means to be deceived. It means you really think something is true, but in fact, it's not true. However, if you believe it's true, it's true for you. And even though it's not really true, it becomes your reality because that's what you believe. You cannot get beyond your own thoughts. Where the mind goes, the man follows. Your thoughts go out ahead of you and they prepare a life for you. And if your thoughts are negative and lousy, you're gonna have a negative, lousy life. If your thoughts are hopeless, you're gonna behave hopeless. If your thoughts are poverty stricken, you'll never have anything. If you think because grandma never had anything and mama never had anything and daddy never had anything, then you'll never have anything, then the devil has deceived you because your victory is not based on a past generation. You can draw the bloodline in your generation of Jesus Christ and you can start a whole new thing. Come on now. We have weapons with which we can defeat Satan. But we're fighting a spiritual war, not a natural war. And our weapons are spiritual weapons. This war cannot be fought in a normal way. We cannot hit Satan, shoot him, strangle him, tie him up with a rope, or put him in jail. Don't you just get so mad at the devil sometimes you just think... <clears throat> Come on, you ever feel that way? She's like... And you just feel so frustrated because you think, well, if I just knew what to do. <laughs> Yet all we really have to do is read the Bible. Sometimes we think, oh, bless God, I'm going to do spiritual warfare. And we get ourselves all wound up and we get in a group, boy. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> and we're marching around. I'm not putting up with you anymore. Well, you know what? I rebuked until I didn't even have a rebuker left and I still had all the same mess in my life. And I screamed at the devil until I didn't even hardly have a voice and I still had all the same mess in my life. 
And yes, we can resist the devil and he has to flee, but you can't quote half a scripture. James 4, 7 says, first, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Come on now. Well, how did Jesus do spiritual warfare? <laughs> I love Acts 10, 38. I think about it almost every morning. See how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. That's spiritual warfare. If you'll get up every single day of your life and you will just set yourself to be a blessing everywhere you go, no matter how bad you're hurting in your own life, the devil just absolutely will not know what to do with you. But what does he tell us to do? Stay home and cry, have a pity party, be depressed, be negative, go to lunch with some other negative Christian you know so you can complain about your problems all day. I know, I've been through all this and I'm still tempted in the same way you are. I don't know why we get such a big kick out of telling everybody our problems over and 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 over. Sometimes there's nothing for us to do but just suck it up and go on. I had a tragedy happen to me about two weeks ago. Oh, this was the, one of the most awful things that's ever happened to me in my, in my uh, writing and ministry career. I had 25,000 words of a book finished that I'm going to be releasing next fall called The Confident Woman. And something happened to my computer that they told me could never happen. It cannot happen because it's saving to the hard drive at the main office and something happened and I worked on this in, in March and April and when I went back to work on it two weeks ago, 18,000 of my 25,000 words had disappeared and was nowhere on the hard drive, nowhere on the computer, nowhere, 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 nowhere. I got myself so upset. Oh, I was so aggravated. So frustrated. Well, then everybody that I got near, I had to tell them my story, just like I just told it to you. <laughs> and everybody that would call, I'd tell them. And everybody that came over, I told them. And everybody that rode in the car anywhere, I told them. And then my husband preached me a short Joyce Meyer sermon. <laughs> and he simply said, I think... You've talked about it enough. <laughs> There's nothing you can do but believe that all things will work out for good and that the second go around will be better than the first and you just have to rewrite the book. Well, that was absolutely true. There was nothing else I could do and the longer I stayed upset about it, the more delighted the devil was. Well, I learned one thing. I'll never write anything again and not download it to a CD at night. I don't care what they tell me. I'm going to burn that baby on a CD so I can't lose it. Amen. So there are times in our life when we just need to not talk about it anymore. Is anybody home out there in the building? Anybody watching my TV understand this? Maybe, just maybe, just maybe you could feel better if you just wouldn't talk about it anymore. Now, some of you drove 200 miles and you're thinking, I drove 200 miles to hear her tell me that. Because <laughs> see, you can even come to a whole conference like this and you can get back in the car with all your Christian buddies you came with and you can discuss all your problems all the way home and you will not be in one better bit of a condition when you get home than you were when you left. And not only that, some of you have already made your mind up when you go home, if that house is not cleaned up like you told them kids and that husband to clean it up, then you have already made your mind up when you walk in what you're going to tell them. You know, see, the devil's already been working on your mind. I'll bet you when you get home, that house is going to be a mess. Because they just don't have any respect for you and you do all the work around here. And it would just be nice if you could go off for one weekend and come home and not have a mess, but you are probably going to have a mess. And then he starts on you. And so this is what you're going to say when you walk in. <laughs> come on now. See, there you are, every one of you. And this is the kind of stuff the devil does to us. He sets us up to get mad before anything ever happens. He sets us up. 
to be in a rage before anything ever happens. When are we going to learn to choose our own thoughts carefully and stop letting the devil use our brain as a garbage dump? Garbage in, garbage out. A stronghold is an area that is dominated by an enemy. If Satan dominates your attitude toward yourself, toward God, toward food, toward money, any area that he dominates your thinking, he is in control in that area. You don't have to eat a whole pound of fudge every time you take a bite of fudge. <laughs> but the devil has told some, well, I just can't eat one chocolate chip cookie. If I ever eat one, I've got to eat 12. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. You do not. You have a spirit of self-control and you can take a bite of a cookie. You can take two bites of a cookie. You can eat one cookie or you can eat no cookies because the spirit of God is dwelling in you. But the devil says, you can never quit smoking. You will never get off those drugs. You can never get over this problem. You'll never get over this addiction. You can never give up sugar. You can never lose weight. You will never be well. You'll never be healthy. You'll never have any money. And nothing can help you if you don't start opening your mouth and saying, devil, you are a liar. And you are not going to steal from me anymore. Yeah. You have a blood-bought inheritance. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are a child of God. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. God's got a good life planned for you. And no matter where you're at right now, you don't have to stay there. You can make progress. John 8, 31 and 32 says, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. The word of God is like a mirror. It says that in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. As we look into the word, it's like looking into a mirror. If you could just imagine... If I had a big full-length mirror up here, we're going to just pretend like this Bible is a mirror. How many times a day does a woman go to the mirror to see if her hair looks all right? Do you know, you can have dirt all over your face and not even know it if you don't go look in the mirror. And then how embarrassed we feel when we think, oh man, you mean I've been running around looking like that all day and didn't even know it. But we don't know what we look like until we look in the mirror. We don't know if our clothes look good or bad. We don't know if something's wrong. We don't know if the hair's right. We don't know if the, the makeup's gone. We, I mean, we don't know. We don't know until we look in the mirror. And see, we don't really know what kind of lives we're living until we look in the mirror of God's Word. That's why you got to be in the Word all the time. Because it's easy to have a good attitude over here five years ago, and then you slip back into a bad attitude. But if you're not regularly studying the Word of God, you forget how important an attitude is. And you know what? What I'm teaching you tonight doesn't have to be any brand new revelation you've never heard. I don't care if you've heard this 500 times in the past. You're hearing it again tonight. You know why? Because some things we have to hear over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I don't know about you, but I need some good preaching on my mind. And if you don't want to hear it, I'll just preach to myself. I look in here and I find out that I've been made right with God through the blood of Jesus. I look in here and I find out that I don't have to live under condemnation because my sins can all be forgiven through repentance and confession. Man, you got to love your Bible. <laughs> you got to love your word. You need to have a good library of teaching tapes and Christian books and CDs and videos. And that needs to be a regular part of your daily discipline. In some way, shape, or form, you need to feed yourself the Word of God just like you feed yourself food. If we would go to the same trouble and lay out the same amount of money to get the Word of God that we do a hamburger or a hot dog, we'd be a lot better off. Some people wanted to come, but they wouldn't drive two hours to get here. But I'll tell you what, you get to wanting a hot fudge sundae bad enough, you'll drive all over town. And I just get tired of this lazy attitude that people have. Well, here I am. I just dare you to bless me. <laughs> Go to Luke chapter 4. 
Well, you got to be hungry for the Word of God and hungry for more of God in your life. Don't be lukewarm and don't ever be spiritually satisfied to the point where you don't want any more of God. Luke 4, verse 1, Then Jesus, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led in by the Holy Spirit. For during 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted, tested, and tried exceedingly by the devil, and during that time he ate nothing, and when those days were completed, he was very hungry. Now, here's what I want you to see before I go any further. First of all, Jesus was following the Holy Spirit when Satan attacked him. There's two times when the devil will come after you. When you're doing something right and when you're doing something wrong. And it's kind of hard sometimes to figure out which it is. So I always start by saying, God, if I'm doing something wrong, if I've opened up a door, please show me. But a long time, I got over thinking that every time I had some kind of a problem in my life, it meant that I didn't have enough faith or I'd open a door for the devil. Satan attacks the righteous. The Bible says the righteous will be persecuted. <laughs> Jesus was following the Holy Spirit and Satan attacked him. Also, please notice that Satan waited until Jesus was weak and tired before he attacked him. Come on, church. If you didn't watch my TV program this morning, you should have. Because I was talking about how important it is for Christians to have balance in their life and to get the right amount of rest. And it's important for your health, but it's also important just because you will not be able to stand against the lies of the devil if your mind and your body and your emotions are so worn out that you can't hardly stand it. And I tell you, all the stress that people live under today, it's demonically induced. No one of us should have to be in a position where somebody can find us seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We really should not be in a position where if we leave to go run a half an hour errand and we forgot our cell phone that we get in a panic. Or when we get up at three o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom, we check our email. <laughs> Don't have any more time for that, but you get my point. I'm also writing a new book, working on it right now. I don't know exactly what I'm going to call it yet, but it's about how to have a, a lifetime of health for your body and your soul. we got to teach people how to take care of themselves. People, you need to take care of yourself. Your body is the house you live in, and if you destroy it, then you have to leave. You can't go somewhere and order another one. You get one shot at this, and if you destroy this one, you're out. And not only that, your body as a believer is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God lives in you and he wants to work through you. And, and if you destroy your health and you destroy your body, then he can't do anything through you either. So you're cheating yourself, you're cheating him, you're cheating the people around you that God wants to use you to bless. And I've come to the conclusion, I believe there's a connection, maybe not for everybody, but I think a lot of people don't take good care of themselves because they got a bad attitude toward themselves and they don't, they don't think they're worthy of doing the things that they need to do to take care of themselves properly. Some of you think that all you're good for is to work, 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 work all the time because you grew up in an atmosphere where the only time people were happy with you was when you were working and producing. And the devil's got you convinced that to enjoy your life is carnal and a sin. Well, you need to go read John 10, 10 because Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. So you know what? I'm working tonight, but I'm enjoying this. Amen. Jesus was following the Holy Spirit when the devil attacked him. Satan attacked him when he was weak and tired. Now, the first thing the devil did and I love this. The first thing the devil did was he tried to make Jesus question who he was. Watch this. Then the devil said to him, verse 3, if you are the son of God, if the devil ever said to you, well, if you're saved, then why do you act that way? Well, if God loves you, why do you have these problems? Okay. You know what he's doing? He's attacking your identity. 
He's attacking who you are in Christ because he knows if he can steal your confidence, he's got your life. You need to know that you're a child of God. You need to know that through the blood of Jesus, you've been made right with God. You need to know that you have an anointing and you need to be willing to say so anytime the devil attacks your thoughts. He not only tried to get him to question his identity, he also tried to get Jesus to take action that was not God-inspired. And boy, do we ever deal with that. Watch this. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, then order this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. How many times in our life are we tempted to get into what the Bible calls works of the flesh? I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. I'm just going to tell you a thing or two. Well, I know. I'll underline one of these Joyce Meyer books and I'll take it home and I'll leave it open to that page my husband needs right by his bed. I'm going to play my tapes loud while he's in the house. Oh, we get all of our little ways that we're going to get rid of our problems. Well, I know what I'll do. Well, I know what I'll do. And you know what we do? We wear ourselves out trying this and trying this and trying this and trying this and trying this. And then you know what we do? It is so hysterical. We finally go to God and we say, well, I've just done everything I know how to do. I just don't know what to do now. And then you go to your friends and you say, I just have tried everything. I guess I'm just all I can do is pray. Isn't that pathetic? I mean, aren't we just pathetic sometimes? I mean, our first line of defense should always be prayer. First and foremost, before anything else, we should always pray. And then if there is an action God wants us to take, he'll speak that to us as a result of us seeking him. But to go take action, then pray God will make it work is backwards. Well, God, I'm going to do this. Make it work. Well, God, now I've done this. Please make it work. Please notice in verse 3, the devil said to Jesus. He put thoughts in his mind. That's how the devil talks to us. He puts thoughts in our mind. But I love verse 4. And Jesus replied, it is written. <laughs> He'd have been in big trouble if he wouldn't have known what was written. Then the devil took him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he said, I'll give you all of this if you'll just bow down and worship me just once. You know, another thing that the devil uses to play with our minds all the time is all this stuff that we can have if we'll just make this little compromise. Well, you know, I mean, everybody else does it. I mean, you know... I mean, I know probably that's really not totally 100% honest, this thing the boss wants me to do, but, you know, everybody else does it. It's not that big a deal. And boy, the devil says, and you know, if you'll just do this one little thing, you'll get that promotion, and then you can give more money to church. Oh, you think the devil won't tell you something like that? You think he won't tell you to compromise so you can have more money to give to God? He absolutely will. People sitting around praying to win the lottery so they can give it all to the kingdom. Well, you know, well and good, but start by giving what you got in your pocket. Because if you're not giving that, you wouldn't give it even if you won the lottery. Just how wonderful would it be if everybody buying all the lottery tickets and buy, you know, going to all the gambling boats and playing. Just how wonderful would it be if people would take that same money and put it in the kingdom work? I know some of you'll write me letters. Just bring them on. Huh? <laughs> anyway, I don't have time to get off on that sermon. But it's just, it, you know, the devil just says, well, you can have this. Well, you can have that. Well, you can have this. If you'll just compromise just a little. Don't you hear those lies? Man, if we would just stop doing things that war against our conscience, how much better would our lives be? I don't care if everybody you know is doing it. If you don't have peace about it, don't you do it. 
If everybody you know does it, if your preacher does it, if, I mean, if the church intercessor does it, I don't care who does it. If you don't have peace about it, don't judge them, but don't you do anything you don't have peace about. I think you're kind of sort of happy, maybe okay, you haven't decided. Amen? Oh, I know, you got to think. It's like, hmm. Satan offered Jesus power, authority, and things in exchange for one, if you'll just bow down and worship me just this one time. Do you know, in some way, shape, or form, the devil's trying to get all of us to bow every day. And then again, if you read through the whole thing, Satan tries a second time to attack Jesus' identity. If you are the Son of God, then let's see you get yourself out of this mess. And each time the devil said something to Jesus, Jesus said something back to him. It is written. It is written. It is written. You know what? You better start talking back to the devil because he is alive and well on planet Earth. Come on now. You know, there, there's kind of a popular in vogue fad today where people believe in God, but they don't believe in hell or the devil. Well, isn't that convenient? <laughs> it's amazing all the stuff that people come up with to believe that's just convenient. Well, I don't believe in tithing. Well, isn't that convenient? <laughs> well, I don't believe in hell. Well, <laughs> that won't keep you from going there. Thank you, Jesus. He wanted Jesus to think wrong. So he tried to put lies in his mind, just like he tries with us. One of the things that I love about these verses is it says that, that immediately following each one of Satan's lies, Jesus said, it is written. He didn't wait and think about it for three days and then decide to say something back to him. The devil said to Jesus, Jesus said to the devil. The devil said to Jesus, Jesus said to the devil. 1 Peter 5, 9 says we are to withstand the devil and resist him at his onset. I love that. I got a hold of that years ago. And it is so important that we come against the lies of Satan right away. I used to have a real problem with self-pity. And I tell you, every time the devil would throw a pity party, I would attend. And he threw special ones for me frequently. <laughs> and God began to deal with me about self-pity. And he began to teach me, you can't be pitiful and be powerful at the same time. You are going to have to stop sitting around here feeling sorry for yourself every time you don't get what you want. And that didn't even mean that what people were doing wasn't unfair. He didn't tell me that they were right. And I was wrong. He just said, you have to stop feeling sorry for yourself when people don't treat you right, when you don't get what you want, when you get mistreated. You have to stop feeling sorry for yourself because you can't have the power to rise above it if you're going to feel sorry for yourself. Well, I knew I had heard from God, but you know what? By then I was addicted to pity. Oh yeah, the flesh loves pity. And I can remember when God began to deal with me about it. And let, let's just say maybe we'd come home from a trip and Dave would say, I'm going to go play golf. Well, that used to be a big problem for me. Now I encourage him to go. But, you know, that's what happens when you're married 39 years. Things change. And it's not that I don't love him just as much. It's just that you just see things. So It's amazing the things that we used to argue about that now it's just like, I can't believe that we used to argue about that. I can't believe it. But oh, I would get so mad and I would feel sorry for myself all day. And so I'd go out and I'd do these seminars and then I'd come home and I would be just like Elijah who defeated all the Baal prophets and then went and crawled around out in the desert under a tree and wanted to die. I'd be the great preacher on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday afternoon and all day Monday, I'd sit home and cry and feel sorry for myself because Dave went to play golf and we got home and he didn't just dote on me. 
Oh, what about me? I, mean, you know, I worked hard all weekend and nobody did anything for me. And I just, everybody just sucks everything out of me and just take, takes everything I've got. And nobody really cares anything about me. You think that moves God? That don't move God. I mean, that does not move God one iota, but it does move the devil. It throws a door wide open for the devil in our lives. And I'm telling you here, you gotta fight for your life. You may feel like feeling sorry for yourself, but it's a demonic emotion. It is not a godly emotion. And it's not going to help you get over your problem. Do something to help yourself. Do you hear me? Do something to help yourself. Quit sitting around being mad because nobody else is helping you and do something to help yourself. I just wish somebody would do something for me. We got to be like David. He encouraged himself in the Lord. If you want somebody to do something for you, instead of sitting around feeling sorry for yourself because they don't, go sow a seed, do something for somebody else. When you got a need, sow a seed. That's how you get a harvest. You sow a seed. If you need somebody to do something for you, sow a seed, go do something for somebody else. That's the kingdom principle. That's the way it works in the kingdom of God. Are we having fun yet? I tell you, I want people to have victory so bad, I just can't hardly stand it. I would love to come out there and unzip you and just cram into you everything I've learned in 29 years and zip you back up and send you home. I'm I know what I'm talking about. It's not going to help you to sit around and feel sorry for yourself. Well, I knew God was dealing with me. I had the revelation. I knew it was not doing me any good. I knew God told me to stop it. I even knew by now that I could not be powerful and pitiful at the same time. But still... When those things would happen that weren't fair, the devil's attacking my mind, and instead of resisting him at the onset and say, no, I'm not going to sit here all day and feel sorry for myself, I would just feel sorry for myself for maybe an hour or two. <laughs> well, I just want to have one cup of coffee with pitiful. <laughs> you know, a little demon called pitiful. Can't you just imagine that, that that old demon spirit, just some old shriveled up, dried up, life sucked out of him, no joy. Chasing you around all the time. You got to say, no! Jesus didn't die for me so I can sit here and cry all day. And then when I'm a sufficient mess and I've got mascara all over my face, I can go look at myself in the mirror. And that's the high point epitome of my day. <laughs> that's why women cry in the bathroom. There's a mirror in there. We have weapons. We have weapons. The word is a weapon. Praise and worship is a weapon. <laughs> God gave me a statement. And I want you to get this. Being thankful is part of praise and worship. And boy, has God been dealing with me lately about just praising him more and worshiping him more and and. And that one of the ways to do that all throughout the day is just every little thing that God does for you, every little thing that goes right, just thank him. Just thank him. Amen. It's one of the ways we can walk in the presence of God all day and, and actually be a worshiper because the Bible says that he is seeking worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. And a worshiper is not just somebody who goes to church once a week and sings a few songs off the overhead. <laughs> well, now I've done worship. No, it's a lifestyle. And so we get up in the morning. Thank you, God, that I got good sleep last night. Thank you, Lord, for a new day. Thank you, I got a, a, a house to live in. Thank you, I got some food in my refrigerator. Thank you for my family. Thank you, God. Amen? I mean, all day long, that can go on. Thank you got me to work safe. Thank you that I got a job. Yeah, just on and on and on. Well, here's what God told me. 
he, you know what? Now listen to me. I mean, obviously we don't want to sit around empty-headed, but sometimes we think too much. And especially we think about the wrong things. You can just think something to death. You can just, I mean, God can put something on your heart to do and you can think about it till you suck all the life right out of it. When God tells us to do something, he doesn't ask us to think about it. He wants us to do it. And here's what God put on my heart. I wrote it down. I like this. He said, you need to think less and thank more. <laughs> you get it? Think less and thank more. You know why? Because you know what we normally think about? And I, I believe God spoke this to me today, so you get this. We think about everything that's wrong and everything that's happened that we don't like, and we think about even every mistake that we've made all day instead of thanking God for the blessings and thanking God for the forgiveness of our sins and thanking God for the blood of Jesus and thanking God that even though we make mistakes, there's hope for us to change. We need to stop thinking about everything that's wrong and we need to start thanking God for everything that's right. I really believe that God showed me that your mind always goes, my mind, it always just automatically goes to what's wrong. There can be 25 things going on right and one little thing going wrong and boy, the mind just wants to get on that one thing. And what we need to do is give that one to God in prayer and we need to thank God for all these things that are right. You know, I told you earlier, I, I don't know if it's in the message of the exhortation time about how I got up this morning, I prayed for an hour and sat and looked out the window and had my coffee and just had a good time with God. And then I read the word for 30 minutes and then it was time for me to get up, and get ready, start getting ready to fly here to the meeting. And I hadn't been out of that prayer chair five minutes and something happened. I don't remember what it was. Somebody didn't do something as fast as I wanted them to or they weren't paying attention to me or I was, you know, I'm a real focused person. I mean, which you got to be to get done what I get done. But, I, you know, I'm real focused. And so if I'm focusing and somebody else is trying to goof around, then it can really irritate me. Well, Dave knows that, so he does it on purpose. <laughs> oh, yeah, he loves to pull my chain. And so, he, you know, he'll just, I'll be, I'll be trying to be real serious. And he'll just be goofing around, you know. And I don't, I don't even remember if it was him I was dealing with this morning, but something went on in the house and, and I got real irritated right after getting out of prayer. Just like, Ugh. okay. Well, the devil tried to hammer me with that for probably half the day. And just pray. You think it's ever going to change? You just came and you have a blah, blah, blah. And how can you just get out of prayer and just act like that? And that's you know to do. And you know what? I'll be honest with you and tell you that probably impatience is still my biggest weakness. But you know what? I thought today, and I feel like God showed me this. You know what? No matter how holy you get and no matter how much you change, no matter how, how far the process of sanctification goes in your life, there's always going to be something. There's always going to be something that you just can't seem to get a handle on. And I'm not trying to start some new weird doctrine here, but I feel like that what God showed me is that's kind of like our thorn in the flesh. And I believe that God leaves something in all of us that forces us to have to realize our humanness and forces us to stay humble before him and forces us to have to lean on him and to keep pressing on in the program. And you know what? Even if you get over the thing you're dealing with now, something else is going to pop up that you don't even know is there yet because God hasn't showed it to you. And so why don't we just stop thinking about what's wrong with us all the time and start thanking God for the changes we've seen and the hope we have and the changes we're expecting. Come on. It's time we start believing the word of God. And I mean, I, God actually showed me this today. It was about four o'clock or five o'clock this afternoon when I finally saw this. 
Because there was something else that happened later on in the day. Oh, I know I, 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 I said something about I was going to talk to somebody about something, Dave, so I don't think you should do that. And I said, well, I think I should. And he said, well, I don't think you should. That might hurt their feelings. I said, well, I think I should. And so then I'm thinking, boy, he's so merciful. And I'm just, you know, I wasn't as merciful. And I should have been merciful. Okay, so now I got these two things. Man, 8 o'clock this morning, I was impatient. And 2 o'clock this afternoon, I wasn't as merciful as I should be. Now I'm supposed to be getting ready to come here and preach this big, powerful, anointed seminar. And I've got impatience and a lack of mercy. I'm just trying to tell you what the devil tries to do to everybody. And you know what I mean? I know the word, so I'm standing against that stuff. But you know, sometimes we just need a fresh word from heaven. And you know, the Lord just said to me when I was praying, did it ever occur to you to think about the 150 things you've done right today? The right choices you've made? The, the blessing that you've been to people? The giving you did? The work you're going to do tonight? Did, does it ever occur to us to think about? No, we wouldn't do that. And you know why? Because the devil's not going to remind you of any of that. He's not going to give you a list of all your qualities and your good choices. And I mean, he's not going to say, congratulations, you made it one more day. Hallelujah. You're pressing on in Jesus. Oh, wonderful. You're going to the Joyce Meyer Conference. I bet you're going to grow. But what he does do is he just sends these little sucker demons after us that every little thing that goes wrong, they're just like leeches. You know what a leech is? I saw a movie last night and a guy got in a muddy river and he came out with this great big leech on him and that thing was sucking blood out of him. And they had to put fire on him to get it to go out. Well, you know what? When those little sucker demons get after us, we need a little to put a fire of the Holy Ghost on them. Back off, devil. You're not sucking the life out of me by reminding me of every little wrong thing I do. Let me remind you of who I am in Christ. God loves me. I'm forgiven. I'm anointed. My heart is right. I may not do everything right, but I don't do everything wrong either. I may not be where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay and I'm on my way. Amen. Give God a big praise tonight. This concludes this message. Thank you for listening. For more information about Joyce Meyer Ministries or to request a free catalog, please contact us on the internet at JoyceMeyer.org.